Okay, hi everyone. So I'm back. Um, it took me a little bit longer to pull together my spread, the spread for trauma uh, than I had intended. And there's a number of reasons for that. I think when you're really working out a spread um, and it's intended for deep work and, and really when, you know, we work with someone like, um, with a, with a deity like trauma, it's going to be deep. Um, it's not immediate. So my first attempt at the video was a little bit, uh, I think it's just a little rambling and unwatchable, frankly. So this is the more like concise, hopefully, hopefully concise, um, and, and formed, you know, um, version of this. So, uh, if you saw the last video, you know that we're, we're working with, um, a version of Kali known to the Tibetans as Kali Troma, or sorry, as just simply Troma Nyangmo. Um, and if you are a pr practitioner of the Chud, which is, um, let's see, I have a card for that too. It's a little mangled up from being on my altar. You know, you're, you're really doing some hard work um, towards, you know, severing attachment Severing attachment to selfhood um, or to a very limited and limiting view of um, a separate self. And you are severing that attachment in order to take on um, the, the more absolute view, which is of interconnectedness. So part of the way that that's done is by invoking trauma using what we have, you know, most Dakinis, this is, this is Troma Nyangmo's Mandala Mansion. Oh, I have, here we go. Uh, this is Vajravarahi's Creation Fusion Man uh, uh, Mandala. Most Dakinis are, you know, have a, um, they use the symbol, the, the six figured, you know, six sided star. So I'm aware <laughs> that at the same time last year, uh, roughly, you know, I was working with a, with another six sided stars the, for the Macaba spread. This is, I think you will find significantly different, um, despite using that same shape, but it, it's really the, sh it's the shape. It's the shape that, that, uh, that trauma you know, works with. So we're essentially working with the different, you know, um, different symbols, right, that, that trauma is invoking in this practice. So the first is the removing of the head, right? So literally the cutting off of the head, um, which is done with a, a ritual kartika, which is what most dakinis, I don't think I have those pictures pulled out. I, I showed them in the last video, right? So uh, this would be what trauma uses to sever your head, um, from your body. Okay. And as I explained in the video before, you know, you're ejecting your consciousness out through the top of your head, which I believe is shown in this particular one. Right? There's like a little, whoop, and there's her consciousness floating around. Um, it does show that she turns into trauma. Okay. So on some level, you know, we're, the consciousness is leaving and trauma takes over. Okay. But as she does, you're, you know, it leaves you vulnerable. That's the whole point. So the first thing is what is the issue that is related to the removing of your head, right? What is it, what is it that we need to sever attachment to? You know, what is it that I've become so attached to that I cannot move forward? You know, that, that my, my beingness, my ability to derive um, compassion and um, empathy for others or, you know, whatever it is, you know, what is it that is, needs to be shifted. And it could be for any reason, but it will always be for the greater good, which is recognizing the absolute nature of things, the relative nature of things, and finding the way to, um, integrate the two so that there is no separation. Um, which seems impossible, but it really is possible. It really is. Um, the second position uses the Kartika then, right? 
So it's representative of the cardica, which is used to remove the head. And it's, it's about examining the tool, right? So, you know, this is, this is of course a figurative idea. This represents what the tool would be. So we're asking Troman Yangmo through what means may I sever this egoic attachment? So what would represent the Kartika in each of our situations, right? So what do we need to do? What is the active means of, um, of severance? That takes us to the third one, right? Once we've severed, we have the tool, we've, we've um, abandoned and let go. You know, this is about transformation. Part of that is understanding what is it that causes us to feel um, separate from others, right? In the sense of the absolute, right? And that's, that's what a mandala is. It's holding all of this in one place. So that means we need to name, you know, the god demons, um, to name the... Um, karmic debt holders, to name our personal demons, um, projected demons, any of those, so that we can identify who and what they are, right? It's going to be utterly related back to this. Once we've identified those who those demons are and named them, then we can move forward and put our bodies into the skull cup. As you can see, it's always kind of put on a tripod, right? It's put onto a, like, yeah, a tripod of three heads. Um, one that is newly deceased, one that is a rotting corpse, and the other one that's already a skull, right? And the different, they're, they're representative of three different aspects of um, different realms. A lot of symbolism here, very deep, very rich symbolism. But what we need to know is that the point of putting the body, chopping it up and putting the skull the body into the skull cup is so that it can be transformed. So all Dakinis hold a skull cup. And I think skull cup here, skull cup, skull cup, and they're holding it at the heart on purpose, right? There's a purpose. Things are transformed through the heart. Um, whatever it is can be transformed through the heart space, right? So just a basic idea of Dakinis. I just kind of pulled those out of the deck. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're purifying and transforming whatever it is that uh, we need to remove, okay? So again, this is, this is again related here, right? We're moving the head. How do we remove the head? What's the tool that we use, okay? This is what we need to sever. This is how we sever it. This is why we sever it, because we're projecting something that's ultimately ours outward onto someone or something else. Then we're taking and we're creating a God demon out of it. It's either good or it's bad, but when it's not whole, when it's not an entire vision, it's not helpful, right? Then we're taking... We're taking all of our, our body that we've, you know, we're going to chop up. We're going to offer it to these God demons. Having severed attachment, what is the best way to purify this as an offering to feed to the karmic debt holders and demons? So that's the next question. Okay. So having, you know, what do we, how do we purify? Right. How do we purify? After we look at how we purify... We then we need to call them in. Okay, so the Kongling, here's a picture of Padampa Sanjay. Um, he's got a, a one, it kind of looks a little bit phallic ultimately, but it, it's not. Um, it's a thigh bone trumpet. So here's Troma's thigh bone trumpet. Um, I believe, yeah, we've got a couple of them. We've got a thigh bone trumpet here and one here. It has a very haunting sound. Um, and because there's, you know, it's the knee bone, right? So there's two bulbs there. One's a little higher than the other, anatomically speaking. So one calls the gods, the other calls the demons. We are asking what trauma, trauma and yang mo, what is the most effective means of calling them in, right? So what is it that I can do to magnetize 
bringing those God, God demons up because we can't feed them. We can't help them. We can't purify that relationship until we know how to draw them in or draw them up. Right? So there will be, so we could think of the Kongling position too as something that may help trigger something in us to bring it forward. This is deep work. This is ultimately very deep work. It's not intended to be soft or friendly. Um, I'll show you in a minute like how, how this could potentially work. I did draw cards for a reading, um, you know, or a spread that I, I can offer to the community so that we can get a sense of, of how this functions, right? So that it's calling it in, calling it up, drawing it up, bringing it up, okay? We're then thinking in terms of we're feeding, right? We're crossing back over the skull cup. We are feeding those demon gods from our skull cup, right? We have transformed whatever pain and suffering in, in our physical body, our attachment to that body, we've transformed it into a nectar, an amrita or a dutsi that can be fed, you know, it becomes the perfect nectar that can be fed then to those god demons so that they are no longer preying on us, right? Uh, they're no longer taking our energy. So we're not sitting there thinking, oh, that damn whomever it is, they're always blah, 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 right? It's deep. If we come back to removing the head, there's some kind of egoic way that that manifests, right? That we're not maybe aware of until we begin to recognize the God demons and draw these connections all together, right? So it's also about developing insight. Once that, you know, once these God demons have been fed, right? then we can move on because as, as they're fed, so too do they transform. So they become no longer God demons, right? They don't become something as separate or as unreachable because they're either in hell and we're terrified of them um, or we hate them or we think they're terrible or we fear them, whatever it is. Um, and we're no longer thinking of them as something unattainable, right? We're not putting them on a pedestal anymore. Suddenly they're on the level with us, on the level. Now we can recognize them as an ally, okay? An ally is honest. An ally holds good, they're complete. They hold the good, they hold the bad, they hold the difficult, they hold the painful, they hold... Um, uh, the insight, they hold the support, they hold space, okay? They give us the information we need so that we can be whole. So as we recognize the ally, the question we ask, once they are fed, how will we recognize a transformed ally in ourselves or others, right? What is that quality that we're looking for that will help us to understand something has shifted or changed and we now have an ally. And then seven is about reintegrating that ally into the entire, you know, the entire, the entirety of who we are so that it's no longer a separate aspect of self. It belongs to both the relative and the absolute. The absolute has known the whole time that this being was never separate. These God demons were never separate from us. They were never separate from any of us. Even if we see them that way, or even if, even if your God demon is, is a real living person, there's something connected to you, right? That's yours. Any way you look at it, they're not separate. So for seven, we ask Troma Nyanmu, what is the lesson to be integrated into our being right now? Okay. But you know what I settled on for this one ultimately was the, the marigold. 
because this one is very confrontational and it feels like a lot of these images really work with um well with the spread you know because we're still we're in the it's it is dark like literally it's black um and you know we're working with images of skulls right and knives this is a pretty confrontational deck actually that's pretty confrontational and it's in you know this is totally in the territory that we're playing so that is the deck that i chose for this one and so what did we get so for the first one removing the head uh for which the question is Trauma and Young Mo, to what must I sever attachment to? Uh, to what must I sever attachment? Okay, so the answer to that for this reading, for all of us, okay, as a community, is the Nine of Cups. I believe the Nine of Cups in the Thoth is, and I'm, I wish I'd thought to pull this out, I believe it's Satiety. Um, being satiated, right? Having its comfort. It's comfort. It's comfort with the status quo. It's um, seeking comfort through stuff and material means. Um, but it's, it's ultimately that we have the coins here for wealth and money. It's staying inside the comfort zone. Um, I have what's mine. I do my thing. I don't want to look outside of my perspective. Um, you know, it's also possibly, you know, I'm thinking in terms of the writer weight, right? Where, oh, sorry about shake cam. Um, where we have a nine of cups that is, you know, it's the fat guy sitting in front of all of his cups, looking completely happy and satisfied with himself, right? Not helpful, you know, on, on, a, on a level of community, whether it's this one or any other. Um, a greater global community, a world community, um, a local community, the tarot community, a spiritual community, that kind of like I'm satisfied in my place and I don't need to move out of it um, or be made uncomfortable by anything or challenged by anything. That's that can be that can be kind of toxic, right? It can it has it, it's definitely limiting. And it's certainly um can encourage this idea of a singular self, you know, a, a self that exists uh, independently of all other um, parts of that community. So that is to what, uh, that is what we are asking to, to sever. Okay, or being told that we need to sever attachment to. So then we get a uh, question two, which represents the Kartika itself, which is, Troma and Yangmo, through what means or how may I sever this egoic attachment? Yeah, so we have the Ten of Cups. So how do we sever it? It's so interesting. This speaks volumes. It's telling us about um, the need to appreciate what we have. If you think about what's in the Ten of Cups, um, again, in the Rider Waite, it's, you know, a ra it's, ra it's rainbows and children dancing and yay, let's celebrate. It's, it's having it all, right? It's having all the stuff, all the happiness, all the whatever, and the pleasure. So we need to take stock, right? We're, rather than being trapped by our material comfort in such a way that we're kind of unwilling to budge or move, um, we're being asked to then say, okay, you know, because this is also a position of fear. If I move or shift my position, maybe I will lose something. Maybe I'll lose what I have, right? This card says, but wait, but you have so much. And I know it's not communicated so well necessarily through this card in a way that we're used to. But if you look, the skulls have third eyes. They have this insight, right? That there's enough. This is full. 
this one's empty. No matter which way you turn it, right, everyone has enough. There's enough to go, literally enough to go around. So we've got to find that way of understanding that we don't need to cling on to this position of comfort because what we can do instead is recognize the gifts, the blessings, how much we have. In doing that, it makes it easier to shift, to be willing to say, okay, what else, right? What else is there? You know, it opens the space. Okay, so that is position two. So position three, and that was the Kartika, is naming those gods and demons. This was an interesting one, guys. So what came up was the Page of Wands. Okay, and I thought that was really interesting because as a reading for the community, what I see in the Page of Wands, um, you know, we've got this skeleton who is, you know, shine. The, the skull is shining. There's flowers. It's everything's great. Everything's beautiful. Um, and yet it's a page. You know, it's this kind of enlightened uh, perspective that comes from a naive place. So I'm going to say that as we name what those God demons are, we're talking about either the spiritual seeker in ourselves, right? The naive spiritual seeker in ourselves that may have been hazed. Okay, there's a couple possibilities here. Choose the one that fits or works for you, maybe more than one. But, you know, I think most of us, a lot of us of a certain age have had that, right? The, you know, you're being hazed because when I came into XYZ, I had to go through all of this, right? Or I'm invalidating your ability to be Page of Wands because when I went through this phase of whatever, you know, I had to do this. So this may also represent spiritual bypassing. Okay, this may also represent the need or the tendency not to feel any discomfort or pain, right, in order to bypass and be love and light, enlightened, perfect, um, somebody who never makes mistakes, somebody who has everything pulled together, um, an attachment to uh, perfectionism or to being perceived a particular way, right? It could be any of those things. It could also be projecting a naive projection of perfection onto someone else in the community. Like this person is just so enlightened. They just know so much. They're so great. You know, um, I guarantee you, it doesn't matter who they are. They're not, they're not. Even the Buddha screwed things up left, right, and center. Um, you know, in, in texts, we find that, that he, I mean, he just screwed up. And then he would go back and say, you know what? That was really dumb. I think we won't do it that way anymore. <laughs> Let's try it like this. You know, um, we gotta, we've got to humanize one another. Uh, and that means recognizing when we're demonizing somebody because something is triggered in us uh, or whether we're elevating them because we're not willing to see the beauty in ourselves. Okay. If you're seeing that beauty in someone else, I guarantee you it's because it's yours. It's because it's yours, because you have that. Um, but it's amazing how hard it is for people to see that in themselves. You know, uh, and I'd say sometimes, too, we're looking at one another um, in different spiritual communities and, and environments and saying, oh, this person is so you know, err, they really get me. Err, that can also be an unwillingness to see the beauty in ourselves. Someone maybe didn't recognize it in us when we were in this place, and so we can't see it. Either way, it's something that needs to be fed. 
It needs to be honored. It needs to be nourished. And it needs to be loved. Okay. So we're putting it here. And we're going to move on. Um, so the skull cup, number four, right? So here's what needs to be purified or uh, transformed. So we asked Trum and Young, well, having severed attachment, what is the best way to purify, uh, purify this attachment as an offering to feed karmic, karmic death holders, demons, and gods? God demons. So what's the best way to feed them? Here's what came up. <laughs> Ta-da! Two of swords. So in essence, quit cutting outward, quit cutting inward. Put the swords, let the swords cross each other. Close your eyes, sit down, have a moment of peace. Okay, have some stillness, have some quietude. Turn inward. Just stop. Just be. Oh, there's a wonderful quote from Machik, who is sort of the Dakini of all Dakinis. She says, don't search, don't practice, just rest in your nature. Don't search, don't practice, just rest in your nature. So sometimes through stillness, um, through spaciousness, through a willingness just to sit with, not against, not away from, not as a means of distraction, but to just sit with the discomfort, which I'm going to say, I'm admittedly, I'm having a difficult time with. I'm in the middle of a purification ritual practice, and it's hard. It's hard, but you know, that looking within word and sitting with, you know, it, it's like the, the, um, Higgs boson molecule, right? That they, they discovered this at, at CERN. Okay. In Switzerland, if you're into physics or if you're a physics nerd, that by simply observing something, it changes. And that's what is this two of swords is, is offering us. That by observing and being willing to observe this discomfort, this pain, whatever is being brought up by this page of wands, it becomes transformed and purified. It's tempered. Okay. And it turns into this beautiful nectar that we then have the ability to offer. Position five. How do we call in the demon? What's the most effective ways of calling them in? came out as the Ten of Swords. So how do we call in this, how do we call in those demons? By willingness to feel and experience that pain, um, you know, whatever it is that comes up. Okay, so in some ways, these two positions, positions four and five in this particular reading, may not be the same for everyone actually but for this particular reading these two seem to go hand in hand right we can purify and transform by turning inward but we call in those demons to be um fed by feeling the pain witnessing it observing it and being willing to release it right ten of swords is always about releasing something it's about game over it's done so that we also call it in through that simultaneous willingness to allow it to be done. Enough. Right? Enough. I'm done. I'm willing to see something as different, um, as complete, you know, and that means being willing to let go of my own perspective of it, my own thoughts. Again, we're in swords, right? Thoughts, ideas, beliefs, you know, and the pain associated with it in order to see something new, right? So how will we recognize that ally? Because the ally is what happens when something has been successfully transformed. So number six, how once it's fed, 
how will I recognize a transformed ally in myself or others? Love this. It's the five of cups. It's the five of cups. You know, this, so the, you know, we, again, those of us who are really familiar with, with RWS, um, you know, and I mean, any, any writer, you know, any writer, any, uh, Golden Dawn based tarot, you know, the five of cups is one of the worst in the deck. Um, it's one of the most painful. Amazingly, we didn't get a three of swords. <laughs> Otherwise we'd have all the minors that everyone cringes over. Right. Uh, but we'll, we're going to recognize that ally because of their willingness to contain and hold and nourish and acknowledge their own pain and suffering. There's a, an awareness of a wound that's real, that's there, it's conscious. Okay, so let's connect this back to our, our page of wands, right? Because they're related. We can see that they're related. But if we look again at our spread... The ally and the god demon are here. We have two of the major um, tools or symbol, symbolic tools that we're going to use that are over on this side. You know, we're taking the offering in the head, we're dumping it into the skull cup, and it's emerging to be reintegrated, right, after going through all of this. So what do we get here? We get, you know... <laughs> What if you look again at this page of wands, whether it's you or someone else, is there an awareness of that pain? Right? To what extent is that wound um, being embraced and acknowledged as an integral part of the self? And, you know, if it's, if it's you who has the wound, I'm going to say so much of us, so many of us do, right? So many of us have wounds around this, you know, incomplete initiations that don't, you know, they're not finished. We don't come out the other side as, as a recognized individual, you know, for all of our blessings, for all of our accomplishment or achievement, because we don't hold those rights and initiations as part of our culture. So we don't know how to work with them, even when we get together as groups of people to try and do them you know, through that desire, we're just not that, we've lost that skill. Um, I'd love to say we're really learning to rediscover it and integrate it so that we can respect these, these different, um, we can respect and hold power for one another and with one another and alongside one another and in a way that is more empowered. But the empowered version of this ally is, is very aware of that wounding and has grown as a result of it, okay? Uh, or there's a willingness to grow, acknowledge that wound, um, love the wound for what it is and for what it has offered, okay? Now, how do we integrate it? Troma Nyangmo, what is the lesson to be integrated into our being right now, okay? So what is it? How do we take this ally and regard it as something out, you know, inside the circle that's with us, inside the mandala of self? Okay, how do we reintegrate her, her, him, it, they, into ourselves? Um, what's the lesson? It comes from the magician. And interestingly, on this one, the iconography could not be more perfect, right? This magician is humble. Look how the, <laughs> we still have the halo, but instead of white, it's gold. Right? So something is transformed and changed. But the magician is holding this orange, this golden orange, close to their heart. You know, this five of cups, this wounding is like a precious jewel. It's something that we can, that teaches us, that teaches us about compassion, 
about wholeness and opens up, you know, when you, when we, when any of us is able to really embrace a wound and love ourselves through that wound, not despite it, but through it, with it, inside of it, what happens is that we transform it from a wound into a precious jewel that's reflective of, of, of a really pure heart. Um, you know, this magician is humble and yet powerful, but the power is not coming from them. It's coming through them, right? So the lesson we learn is that through being willing to accept and honor and love and respect our wounding, um, we, we become whole. We become beyond whole. We become, we tap into our real power. We trap in, tap into our true power. Okay. So there we have it. Quite, quite a spread there. Let's see. I can move back a little bit. I think we can still see it, although the camera's precarious. But, um, yeah, this is it. So it's deep work. Let me know in the comments if this is something that you would like to know more about. Um, if you have questions, anything like that, I have no idea how long this is going to have been. Um, but you know, there we go. It's, you can't really do concise, you know, deep work is not by nature concise. So if you're here or if you're still here by the end of this, um, honestly, my, my humble bows to you, um, for your interest in your, 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 um, attention and your time. And uh, with that, I will say, I will see you in the next one. <laughs> I have no idea what or when it'll be, but you know, it'll be coming up. So take care, friends. Bye.